Crouched in a trench near enemy lines, a 13-year-old boy adjusts his oversized helmet. Like many of his comrades, he is a conscript in the Iranian paramilitary militia. Except for some desultory fire by enemy pickets, the front is quiet. Suddenly, an officer shouts, Jumping to his feet, the other soldiers scramble to get in line, most of whom are trembling with fear. Ahead of them, atop a gently sloping ridge covered in minefields and barbed wire, the Iraqis stare down their gun barrels, waiting for the inevitable attack. Sadly, the situation faced by the boy and his fellow conscripts will be a common sight during the brutal conflict between the Provincial Revolutionary Government of Iran and the military dictatorship of Iraq. I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. In today's video, we'll be examining the 1980s Iran-Iraq War, a war of contradictions and anachronisms, with soldiers choking on clouds of mustard gas and struggling through fields of barbed wire while modern jet fighters exchange fire above their heads. And yet, for all of its bloodshed, this deadly conflict will end in a frustrating stalemate. But first, I'd like to thank my sponsor, Raid Shadow Legends, because sometimes the best way to unwind after a long hard day of animating people fighting each other in the desert is to play a game where you don't need to animate people fighting each other in the desert. Raid Shadow Legends is the now ubiquitous turn-based RPG for Android and iOS devices. Assemble a team from 16 different heroic factions, then take them on adventures through 13 spectacularly realized locations. Raid Shadow Legends even has a feature called Multi-Battle Auto Mode that allows you to step away for however long you need while battles run in the background. With both a PvP area and a fully voiced single-player campaign, Raid Shadow Legends is fun for players of both turn-based RPGs and online multiplayer RPGs. While you're playing, don't forget to check out the weekly tournaments and events for the chance to win the offered prizes and rewards, and check out the numerous updates that'll be rolling out over the next six months, including new factions and a faction war feature. Check out the description below and use my link to get 50,000 silver and a free champion to start your journey today. As pointless as the war was, it was an unavoidable product of the volatile situation present in the Middle East at the time. The relationship between Iran and Iraq was particularly unstable as Saddam Hussein desperately wanted control over the Shat al-Arab waterway, as well as Iran's oil-rich Khuzestan province. The 1975 Algiers Agreement was supposed to have solved this dispute, but Saddam chafed under its constraints. Besides, he only signed it to end a Kurdish rebellion supported via Iranian arms shipments. His militant attitude only intensified after the 1979 Iranian Revolution, which saw the rise of an Islamic theocratic government that was ideologically opposed to Saddam's secular Ba'athist dictatorship. Tensions finally boiled over into open hostility on September 22, 1980, when the Iraqi Air Force commenced a preemptive strike on Iranian airfields. The following day, six Iraqi ground divisions stormed the border, aiming at the Khuzestan province and Shat al-Arab waterway. But despite the element of surprise, the Iraqi air assault faltered thanks to a lack of modern bombers. With most of its air force safe inside hardened shelters, the Iranians retaliated with their own air raids on Iraq's infrastructure and armored divisions. One of these raids, Operation Scorch Sword, heavily damaged the incomplete Absarak nuclear reactor, 17 kilometers, or roughly 11 miles, south of Baghdad. Despite being harried by F-4 Phantom jet fighters and AH Super Cobra attack helicopters, the Iraqi columns rumbled toward Khorramshahr. Here, their advance stalled bogged down by intense street fighting that produced 7,000 casualties on both sides, including 200 Iraqi armored vehicles. Although a tactical defeat for the Iranians, a 49-day battle delayed the Iraqi advance long enough for 200,000 Iranian volunteers to reach the front lines. 
By early November, the sieges of the Kuzitstan province had set the tone for the rest of the war. Denied a decisive victory, Saddam ordered his forces to halt and consolidate their gains in December. On January 5, 1981, Iran launched Operation Nasser, or Victory. Three massive tank columns smashed into the Iraqi defensive lines around the besieged city of Dezful. Although intended as a surprise attack, the Iranian forces were spotted by observation planes as they crossed the Karka River. Given time to prepare, the Iraqis bunkered down and waited for the attack to become mired in the treacherous floodplains surrounding Susingurd. The result was a decisive Iraqi victory, with between 100 to 200 Iranian tanks lost. The Iraqis lost fewer than 100 fighting vehicles. However, while Saddam continued to dominate on land, the Iranians exploited their advantage in the skies. On April 3rd, a force of eight F-4 Phantoms and four F-14 Tomcats attacked the H-3 airbase. The strike occurred deep behind enemy lines and was one of the few successful stealth operations of the war. By the time the smoke cleared, at least 27 enemy planes had been destroyed. Major damage had been done to the airfield itself and the unscathed Iranians scoffed. After these early operations, both combatants settled into a rhythm familiar to any veteran of the Great War. Waves of Iranian conscripts would hurl themselves at Iraqi fortifications, suffering hundreds of lives for a few meters of blood-soaked sand. Conversely, the Iraqi troops clung to their static defense like limpets, their commanders unwilling to risk the wrath of their insane dictator by showing any tactical initiative. Thus, while the Iranians suffered huge losses in each assault, even minor breakthroughs quickly snowballed into the encirclement of entire Iraqi divisions. The stalemate was finally broken when Iranian strategists realized the crucial flaw with Operation Victory. With this in mind, they launched Operation Undeniable Victory in March 1982. Although merely an escalation of human wave tactics the Iranians had already been employing, the sheer size of the renewed assault was enough to breach the Iraqi defensive line and drive them out of the Kuzitstan region. Fueled by little more than sheer determination, the Iranian conscripts continued to advance, liberating Khorramshahr on May 24th and pushing the Iraqi military back to the border by late June. Sometimes a little adjective goes a long way. When news reached Saddam, heads began to roll. Anyone considered responsible for the Iraqi retreat was executed, including at least 300 officers and 10 generals by the end of 1983. Apparently too busy killing his own people to continue fighting, Saddam tried suing for peace in mid-1982. However, the supreme leader of Iran flatly rejected his proposal, declaring his intent to continue the war until the Ba'athist regime had been replaced by an Islamic Republic. This proved to be no idle threat, as Iran launched Operation Ramadan on July 13, 1982, sending more than 100,000 revolutionary guards and militia, some as young as 12, straight toward the entrenched Iraqis. At first, their fervor proved a match for machine guns and artillery barrages, but quickly faltered against the vast clouds of tear gas the Iraqis deployed in clear violation of the Geneva Convention. Although it temporarily secured a 50-kilometer or 31-mile stretch of Iraqi territory, Operation Ramadan ultimately did little more than send 20,000 men to their graves alongside 400 armored vehicles. The Iraqis, meanwhile, lost about 9,000 soldiers and at least 700 vehicles. Sadly for the troops caught up in this slaughter, neither side was willing to compromise. Iranian propaganda painted the war as a righteous jihad and a test of their nation's devotion to Allah, ensuring a near endless wave of fresh soldiers to replace the hideous losses they were suffering. Iraq, meanwhile, began receiving large supplies of war material from the Soviet Union and other countries, allowing Saddam to continue his belligerent attitude in spite of a rising economic crisis. Convinced they could replicate the success of Operation Undeniable Victory, Iran continued their assaults throughout 1983 and early 1984. But out of seven major offensives, only two were strategic victories. 
On the other hand, Iran still dominated the air war despite having fewer than 70 operational aircraft. As human waves continued crashing impotently against the Iraqi defensive line, Iranian strategists grasped the need for a new approach. Lacking the equipment to assault Iraqi strongholds, the Iranians began probing for weaknesses along the enemy lines, taking advantage of favorable terrain whenever possible. Such terrain was identified in the wetlands covering most of southern Iraq. The region was also full of Kurdish guerrillas known as the Peshmerga, who were more than willing to cooperate with the Iranians against the genocidal Saddam. However, despite training a large commando force for an amphibious assault, Iran's first attack through the marshes in late February 1984 was a disaster. Iraqi forces responded with mustard gas and submerged electrical cables, turning whole sections of marshland into inescapable death traps. Over 40,000 Iranian troops and 49 helicopters were lost in the assault, making this one of the bloodiest battles of the war so far. Iraq's economy was also starting to falter around this time. Syria, a supporter of Iran, closed a crucial pipeline which prevented Iraqi oil from reaching tankers in the Mediterranean and consequently decreased the Iraqi budget by 5 billion a month. In response, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and other Arab countries intervened on Iraq's behalf, fearing the growing influence of Iran in the region. In true Gulf state fashion, their aid came in the form of 60 billion in subsidies per year. Western European countries and the US were sympathetic to Iraq as well, and the US increased support in 1982 by providing diplomatic, monetary, and military support, including billions of dollars in loans, political influence, and intelligence on Iranian deployments gathered by American spy satellites. Meanwhile, at sea, Iraq began targeting Iranian shipping in order to provoke Iran into closing the vital Strait of Hormuz, which would almost certainly trigger an American intervention. Iran, in turn, retaliated by attacking Iraqi shipping, and the two sides waged a tanker war for the next five years that resulted in damage to 546 commercial vessels and the deaths of 450 sailors. Unable to conduct offensive ground operations, Saddam Hussein ordered the Iraqi Air Force to begin bombing civilian targets in Iran. Between 1984 and 1988, five large-scale air raids racked up a civilian body count in the tens of thousands. To counter these atrocities, Iran developed a highly sophisticated air defense network combining interceptors and surface-to-air missiles, successfully downing many Iraqi aircraft. Iraq then started employing Soviet-made Scud missiles and domestically manufactured Al-Husseins. While notoriously inaccurate, the Al-Hussein possessed a 1,102-pound high-explosive warhead and a 400-mile or 643-kilometer range, making it a potent terror weapon. During a seven-week period in 1988, Al-Husseins killed 2,000 Iranian civilians and injured 6,000 more. Unwilling to let Iraqi aggression go unanswered, Iran purchased Scuds from Libya and launched them against Baghdad. Back on the front line, Iran finally won a major victory in the first battle of El Fal in early 1986, severing Iraq's access to the Persian Gulf. Saddam's forces countered by seizing the city of Mehran in mid-May, but the enemy recaptured it in June. Desperate to avoid further incursions, Iraq adopted a dynamic defense strategy that enlisted the support of the entire civilian population. Male university students were drafted into the military in droves, and civilians were ordered to clear marshlands and help construct static defenses. Vast quantities of foreign equipment poured into Iraq as well, and Saddam was able to expand his military to 600,000 men, making it the fourth largest in the world. Heedless of the odds being stacked against them, Iran now staged a three-pronged offensive aimed at capturing the city of Basra. On December 25th, 1986, Iranian forces attempted to capture the island of Umm al-Rasas. Though successful, they sustained 16,000 casualties in the process. But all this was just a drop compared to the ocean of blood spilled during the main Iranian attack. 
Operation Karbala 5, aka the Great Harvest. It was the largest battle of the war, pitting 300,000 determined Iraqi defenders against 150 to 200,000 Iranian invaders. But after weeks of assaults and an artillery bombardment that reduced most of Basra to smoking ruins, the Great Harvest had reaped nothing more than 65,000 Iranian casualties. This was the beginning of the end. Throughout the rest of 1987, Iran mounted no more major offensives, and the rhetoric of a holy jihad began to falter in the face of war exhaustion. Already strained by years of warfare and economic sanctions, the Iranian economy virtually collapsed under the additional weight of Iraqi missile attacks and bombing campaigns. In July 1987, the UN Security Council passed Resolution 598, urging a ceasefire and a return to pre-war boundaries. But Saddam was far too busy preparing for future offensives to heed this call for peace, and his Iranian counterpart, Ruhala Khomeini, still believed in a divine justification for war. Ultimately, for Khomeini, no amount of zeal for Allah could save the Iranian forces from defeat at the Second Battle of al Fal in mid-April of 1988. Spurred by their victory, the Iraqis initiated Operation Trust in God on May 25th. Over the next two months, Iraqi forces won a series of victories, inflicting 32,000 casualties on the Iranians while sustaining only 5,000 themselves, and captured vast quantities of equipment. Under pressure from his advisors to end the war, Khomeini grudgingly accepted the UN's proposed ceasefire on July 20th, although pockets of fighting lasted until mid-August. The Iran-Iraq war resulted in tremendous death and destruction on both sides, with casualty figures ranging in the hundreds of thousands and total economic loss somewhere around $1.2 trillion. Above all, Iraq emerged from the conflict as the dominant power in the Middle East, thereby emboldening Saddam to continue his expansion policy, which would lead to a climactic showdown with the West three years later.